Welcome to the Rye Historical Society's Happy Hour History. I'm Debbie Tui, and I have my COVID vaccine shot. I'm very excited. I went up to the New Hampshire um, Speedway in Loudoun, New Hampshire today, and got my Pfizer, my first Pfizer vaccine. Yay! And <clears throat> I'm a board member of the Rye Historical Society, and I'm going to be concluding Just Rye Harbor today with you. And I can tell, <clears throat> since my throat's a little scratchy, I'm gonna say happy hour, happy history. I'm having a beer that is um, from the Vermont Beer Makers and it's called Feather. And it's about a 4% and it's really tasty, it's lovely. So here's to that on a wet, dreary afternoon. I'm glad to uh, be reading to you shortly. <clears throat> if you're following, it's page 233, 233, chapter 30, <clears throat> and it's Ragged Neck, which is over to the north side of Rye Harbor. Great little park. Of the North Side Jetty. Rosemary Clary talked with Ragged Neck residents Jim and Betty Trenholm in August of 2004. Betty Smith Trenholm is the niece of Harriet Norman and Cecil Brightman, the siblings who owned and rented five houses on that point. Sadly, gentleman and scholar Jean Putnam who lived at Ragged Neck for many years, passed away in October 2004. This cheerful man contributed handmade miniature models of the white light at the Isle of Shoals to help Sue Reynolds and the Lighthouse Kids save the light. Jim Chenholm, his neighbor, used to help Jean with the models until Putnam's death. It was therefore fitting that at Jean's wake in Hampton, a few dozen of these boxed lighthouse models were put on a table for visitors to take. Three of the houses at Ragged Neck with their gambrel roofs still look the same. <clears throat> when Betty Trenholm was uh, 10 years old in the fifth grade, her mother would come bi-weekly to clean the cottages to prepare them for renters. She recalls how boring it was as a child. There was nothing to do, no other children, and she was happy to return to North Andover, Massachusetts. Jim and Betty recall that they used to rent at Ragged Neck in the 1920s. By the early 1930s, all cottages had names. The Trenholm Place, which was number 1738, is still called Nautilus. Next door, number 1734, 1734 called Illyria, is named after Norman Brightman's mother, Illyria. And I actually looked up Illyria so I would know how to pronounce it. And it's a region around Croatia in that area of the world. Another cottage named Zefla was named after Betty Tremholm's mother. The Tremholms recall cedar trees in a tidal creek that was a brook at low tide. The cottages were built on cedar posts. The five cottages were very drafty. Jim and Betty had summered at the Ragged Neck House since 1941 and had used it as a winter residence since 1970. Jim remembers waiting for, for a mooring for 15 years with no success. Then he learned a key fact. If you owned a harbor, front, a harbor waterfront property, you could demand a mooring, like being in a club. He then claimed his mooring rights. Today, everything is highly illegal. Stickers on moorings with balls against both periodically checked. But Jim, oh, sorry. <laughs> Today, everything is highly legal. Stickers on moorings with balls against both periodically checked. But Jim says he still likes life as it was in the olden days when your word and a handshake were worth everything. And there are still some places and people you can deal with that it is like that up here in Rye in other parts of the world. Jim says that the Parks and Recreation Building, now owned by the state of New Hampshire, was originally owned by the Banker family of Portsmouth until World War II. The Coast Guard confiscated the building along with Odeorn Park through eminent domain. 
Betty is still glad her houses were not taken, even at a fair price. The Appalachian Mountain Club has created a half-mile walk it calls Ragged Neck Trail at Rye Harbor State Park. The trail is presented as including a park, granite seawall, and a working harbor with outstanding ocean views. The special features listed as exceptional seacoast views, marina jetty, Isle of Shoals on horizon, and harbor seal and cormorant views. This is the way Julia Older and Steve Sherman described the trail in Nature Walks Along the Seacoast. Starting at the park headquarters, an alleged bootlegger's hideout during Prohibition crossed the parking lot to an unmowed area on the north side of the park, turn seaward, and walk the mowed lawn along a canterbrake of feather grass. grass. These Feathery tipped canes are seven feet tall, but can grow to 12 feet. On, these exposed, on this exposed rocky peninsula, the little patch of feather grass provides protection for ducks and birds. In a few feet, wild raspberries and staghorn sumac offer vitamin C rich food for the song sparrow and catbird we heard calling from the dense undergrowth. The staghorn sumac forms a hedge of red conical berry branches and fuzzy antler-like branches from which it derives its name. Hugging in the sunlight on the periphery of the cane break are stalks of salt-tolerant herbaceous seaside goldenrod. Its flat-topped flowers and leathery gray-green leaves do not resemble the goldenrod with spray-like flowers found inland. Walk around the picnic tables to the low granite wall that separates the mowed lawn from the rocky shore. Popping up here and there are daisies and beach roses on the high reaches of the rocky tidal shoreline. If you decide to walk among the rocks and explore the tidal pools where rubber soled shoes and stop before you get to the slippery yellow green ladder rack, a common rockweed that covers the intertidal area. <clears throat> this side of the cove overlooks Rye Beach, where granite and a few quartz veins were deposited by glacial by glacier thousands of years ago. New Hampshire is known as the Granite State, and from its quarries came round curbs, bridges, retaining walls, as well as the field granite of thousands of miles of stone walls. Cormorants are often preening on the large, dark boulders near the entrance to Rye Harbor. This process stimulates the bird's oil pores, which in turn lubricates their feathers. Because of this oil coating on their feathers, cormorants can dive for fish without getting waterlogged. Nearly, nearly black feathered cormorants have yellowish faces with brilliant red around their beaks and eyes. One evening, we saw a cormorant on a flat table rock. The setting sun gave the diver the appearance of a firebird. Continue to the rounded head above the ragged neck. From the benches here to the point, it's as if you're sitting on the prow of a ship. Straight out to sea, the Isle of Shoals are prominent on the horizon about five miles distant. Combined with Portsmouth, this group of nine islands, discovered by John, Captain John Smith in 1623, comprised the largest inhabited area outside of Boston during the 17th century. In this part of the New World, cod was king. At the Shoals, in clear weather, the ministers cut their sermons short for the cod fishermen. Shoals done fish, cod cured with seaweed on wooden fish flakes, and exported to London and Spain, made many a fisherman wealthy. The population of the shoals decreased in the 18th century, largely due to an overfishing, more lucrative endeavors on the mainland and war. By the 19th century, the shoals were again largely populated, this time with large 300-room resort hotels. On a clear day, you can identify the larger islands, isles from the coast. North to south are Duck, Appledore with the World War II radio tower, Malaga, Smutty Nose, the, spite, the site of several brutal axe murders in the 19th century, Cedar, Star with its White Hotel, White Island, and Lighthouse, 
and Lunging, an early Londoners trading post. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip. <clears throat> Continue around the periphery and soon you come to an unmowed meadow of red and white clover and goldenrod. Do not walk through it. Poison ivy may be growing, and that's no fun. Instead, find the cleared gravel path leading to the Stone Harbor breakwater. Caution. If you wish to walk all the way to the end of the seawall, this part of the walk is difficult. Hold the hands of small children and go out only a little way onto the flat rocks. Older children and adults should wear rubber-soled shoes and premeditate every step. Although caution must be used when walking here, many anglers and sightseers, including older children, um, often enjoy clambering over the Leviathan granite boulders. Two sides of this seawall are like night and day. On one side are lobster fishers, whale watching cruise ships, Isle of Shoals tour boats, and private sailing yachts. On the other side, the deep blue Atlantic lilts or crashes against the breakwater. Jeffrey's Ledge, several miles offshore, serves as a feeding ground for 40 ton humpback whales, finback whales, and smaller minke whale, the endangered right whale, and harbor seals. Granite State Whale Watch is staffed by zoologists and biologists providing research information to the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, and offers an opportunity for viewing sea mammals in their natural habitat. We've seen golden seals swimming here, so keep a lookout. The harbor is full of sights and sounds. The last time we were on the jetty, we saw a beach ball sized jellyfish floating in the blue green water on the Atlantic side as the Shoals tour boat chugged in with a crowded deck. One peculiar phenomenon of the large expanse of water that is that the sound carries well. If someone is talking across the channel, you can hear every word clearly. Returning to the first boulders on the jetty, make your way down the rock steps onto the pebble beach on your left. Tide usually leaves a patch of pebbles and mud to explore, which a closer inspection reveals a prolific barnacle and periwinkle population. These tooth-like projections of the barnacles on the rocks open when the tide comes in and feathery tongues feed on minute particles of algae. Periwinkles are not natives to New England, but they thrive here. These small males, snails, provide food for wading gulls and other water birds. Head back toward the picnic pavilion in sight when the walk ends. As you return along the shoreline, tireless sandpipers may be nearby, pecking at hoppers and other creatures on the, on the sand. These small, quick-stepping birds always seem a few steps ahead of you, as in Celia Thaxter's popular poem, known by many New England schoolchildren. Across the narrow beach we flit, one little sandpiper and I. I watch him as he skims along, uttering his sweet and mournful cry. My cat is patrolling, sorry, that's why I keep looking up. Ragged Neck is indeed a favorite space for bird watchers. You may be pleasantly greeted there by the knowledgeable Pat Plough, a longtime New Hampshire Department of Parks and Recreation employee. In the New Hampshire birding list on the internet, James Smith of Keene, New Hampshire, mentioned seeing on October 22, 2004, off right Ragged Neck, three red-throated loons, one Merlin, four Dunlin, one molting juvenile white-rumped sandpiper. That same day, Joanne O'Shaughnessy of Hampton reported sighting a snow bunting, her first sighting of the bird all year. The day before, Glenn Curley saw surf scooters, common loons, two red-throated loons, a pair of male buffleheads, and a small flock of sanderlings. Said Curly, the sea was pretty rough and made for some hard viewing. The best part was seeing the red-throated loons still in about 75% of their nuptial plumage. On October 18, John Wolfe of Manchester, 
mentions seeing more than 200 cinderlings, a few semi-palmated plovers, and the usual common eiders and many gulls. The Audubon Society of New Hampshire's weekly rare bird alert noted that on October 31st, a short-eared owl was seen in the marsh south of Rye Harbor State Marina. On November 1, a snowy egret was seen in the same area and a great eager egret was seen in the marsh northwest of the marina. The alert reported that on November 7 at Ragged Neck, a black-headed gull, a black-legged kittywake, and two black guillemots, two purple sandpipers, four green-winged teal, and a cooper's hawk were seen. On the week of October 22, 2004, Two Caspian terns, a short-eared owl, three brant, and a Baird's sandpiper were seen by watchers in the area. The week before, an adult little gull was seen flying south from Ragged Neck along one of Bonaparte's, along with one Bonaparte's gull. A Baird's sandpiper was also present in the cove just north of the parking lot. In late September of 2004, birders spotted an adult male king eider just north of Ragged Neck. Following the passing of Hurricane Jean to the south, two Foster's turns were seen near Rye Harbor. And I can tell you, not, not in the last two years, but certainly anybody that is in this area or birds in this area, uh, Ragged Neck, we saw the snowy owl, several of them, um, for two or three years, which was very exciting. So we're talking about... 2016, 2017, 2018, probably. Not so much this year. <clears throat> Chapter 31, a father and a daughter find each other. A few years ago, Harbor Master Leo Axton took a group of eighth grade science students on a well watch ride, as was his daily custom. A radio message received from U.S. Coast Guard boat started an incident Axton has never forgotten. He admits it was one of his favorite sea stories. Sometimes wonderful things happen on these daily whale watch trips out of Rye Harbor. The following was published April 1999 titled, Yes, My Dad is So Cool. So what does your dad do? It is reprinted courtesy of the Coast Guard Academy alumni magazine and author Coast Guard Captain Raymond Brown. And this is how it reads. The naval officer is truly unique, for he must have the capacity to simultaneously love his country, his service, his family, his shipmates, and the sea. He needs each of them unquestionably as each of them needs him. And the demands which each place on him never diminish, they only grow. Admiral Joe, I'm sorry, Admiral John Buckley, M-O-H. Perhaps one of the unsung benefits of being an American sailor is that your family can be so proud of what you do, though they seldom, if ever, can see you in action. There, there is a certain, come on, come on up. There is a certain esteem that abides. As Admiral Buckley wrote about the naval officer's experience, it is the honorable profession. I came to experience the pride of my family in a special way off the Isle of Shoals, where my daughter did, in a small way, see me in action. It was a six-week patrol just prior to a dry dock availability. I was nearing two years of command of CGC as Canaba, in, in parentheses WMEC-907, all having gone very well. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah, he's left. <clears throat> but I was well aware of the cost of the family of my having been at sea over half the time. In particular, my 13-year-old daughter, Emily, our oldest, was growing up, and I had not gotten used to the idea. Exacerbating Emily's and my mutual adolescent passage, during my seaward sojourns, her mother, Susan, affectionately called Cinch Homefelt, had, respons had responsibly granted her both new responsibilities and privileges commensurate with her coming of gulp age. 
I usually found out about these changes the hard way. A new procedure was usually discovered by Emily's overreaction to my overreaction. In particular, I remember waiting up for Emily to get home from a babysitting job. I did so because I wanted her to know that I loved her enough to remain awake. Heck, the captain never really sleeps anyway. But Emily emotionally remonstrated that obviously I did not trust her, and so it went. Over my two years in command, we had made three Caribbean deployments and five Northwest Atlantic patrols. In this most recent ride, we had already made two seizures, and the crew was feeling good. They had earned that right. So was I, but I also knew that it was time to shore up my family ties. Grace happened. Homeported in Boston and living in, in New Hampshire when infrequently ashore, I knew that Emily's eighth grade science class would be embarking on board a whale watch boat out of Portsmouth one specific day in May while Escanaba uh, patrolled. Wistfully, I wished that our tracks might cross, but I knew quite well that the chances were slim. My principal mission was well offshore in the 5,000 square nautical miles of areas closing close to fishing. Moreover, I preferred to give any and all whales as wide a berth as possible. Temporarily embarked with us were a tech rep and electrician doing some work on one of our gyro compasses. Early one evening in the Gulf of Maine, the engineer officer advised me that the work had been completed much earlier than we had anticipated. Checking weather, time, and distance, the best place to depart, debark our two passengers was in the approaches to Portsmouth by gunboat Shoal, as it happened, on the day of Emily's whale watching trip. Wow. Maybe I would see my daughter's expedition. Certainly, duty would not permit any grand schemes, but the chance was there. As mists broke the next morning, we lay to off Portsmouth affording a 45, a 44 foot Coast Guard utility boat, a lead. On on, upon departing, our guests, we proceeded outbound. I did see one student filled whale watcher during our transit and did call on FM radio. However, the master, kind enough to check, did not have anyone named Emily Brown on board. Oh well. I suppose that an actual rendezvous at sea had been too much to hope for. I scanned the misty horizon with binoculars and I spied no prospects, checked the track line, and then went below to plan patrol tactics for the next few days. However, unbeknownst to me, the master of the boat in which Emily actually was embarked had overheard the conversation on his FM speaker, and Emily's teacher had been in the pilot house at the time. She went to get Emily, who was incredulous that her father had been on the radio. Meanwhile, the master had established contact with my officer of the deck, who in turn told his incredulous captain that he had been contacted by the boat carrying his daughter. Like any commanding officer, I could get to the bridge in a hurry when I had a mind to. In moments, I was speaking to the master of Granite State, who advised that he was about to put my daughter on the radio telephone. Dad, this is Emily, over. Emily, this is Dad. I was waiting for you at Gunboat Shoal at nine. Where were you, over? I don't know, somewhere out on the ocean, over. The guys here are on watch or laughing. No one else uses that tone to me, over. Well, somebody needs to take you down a peg and keep you in your place, over. I really miss you, Emily, over. I really miss you too, Dad. Over. And so the banter went on for a while before we signed off telling one another that we loved each other. I did have Emily pass her position, which she did very professionally upon reading the, D -G the DGPS printout. Emily and I had both supposed that our delightful and unexpected conversation was itself more than either of us could have ever expected but checking the transmitted position, I noted that Granite State was but six miles north of us. Cross-check with radar showed them closing. With no further communication between Escanaba and uh, Granite State, I had us alter course to the north slightly. We were bound for the Bay of Fundy anyhow. Visibility was about four miles. 
As we made our approach, Emily's class was excitedly lining the rail as out of the mist, we became more and more visible. Emily stationed herself all the way forward in the eyes of the ship. She was waving frantically. I took us alongside at a couple of hundred yards. From my starboard bridge wing, I waved frantically back to my daughter. Pretty soon my crew and the kids all started waving. Then we proceeded on duties assigned, providing just a little wake, though it would be retold as a, <laughs> as a tsunami. <laughs> to our student admirers, no matter whether a landlubber or an old sea salt, a commissioned ship making way is always a noble and moving sight, probably because a commissioned ship is noble and moving. The next time a helicopter brought up parts and mail, I received a letter from Emily. It began, you are so cool. In breathless enthusiasm, Emily recounted the drama of the approach of her father's ship, her yelling, that's it, as the lines took distinct form and the surprise to fellow students who seemed to have been expecting the yacht and the boys who didn't care a whit that no whales were seen that day because they witnessed a commission ship with guns. The seaward encounter became the hit story at school, growing all out of proportion as tales of the ocean invariably do. This is one of my favorite yarns, probably because I can share it with Emily, who tells it with or without me. But she adds something else that is very special to me, a father who so often regretted the time away. She would say that in the buzz among her classmates over this incident, she was tempted to ask certain of her peers, the proverbial cool dudes and dolls of the in crowd. So what did your father do? But she didn't have to ask. They knew, and she knew what would have been the hidden meaning. Nor did she ever again feel the need to explain how and why her own father was so often away doing the nation's business at sea in the honorable profession. That's nice. And then I will sip, and then we're going to conclude with chapter 32, which is titled Artists, Writers, and Poets. Cheers. Happy March 28th, 2021. Oh, I'm in trouble. The handle is low and I shall not spill. There we go. <clears throat> Page 243, chapter 32, artists, writers, and poets. J. Rich Richardson Adams, who is addressed by friends as Dick, has been painting professionally for many years. He is seen from time to time at the harbor, often photographing boats by evening light for use in his works. As a young man, he received scholarships to two prestigious institutions, the Art Institute of Chicago and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, but was unable, to, unable at the time to enroll in either. However, he did work with several artists who were members of the so-called New Hope School of Painters. The meanderings of life led James Richardson Adams to a career in engineering, working for CBS's developmental laboratories. He studied the scientific measurement of color and helped the company obtain numerous patents. He later worked in the computer field on the technical aspects of color and was a consultant for Polaroid Corporation. He retired from the industry in 1976 and now concentrates on painting for his own pleasure and that of others. Adams has exhibited at many universities and museums and, although not winning in the stiff competition these days, has received honorable mentions, including a recent one from the Courier Museum in Manchester, New Hampshire. He's currently a member of the American Watercolor Society and the North Shore Arts Association, and his work was selected for the 55th Annual New Hampshire Art Association Exhibition at the Courier Museum of Art in 2003. Today, he is just as motivated as ever when he views Rye Harbor. Peter Randall, noted photographer, author, publisher, and historian, has been around Rye Harbor since his family moved there in 1958. Until quite recently, 
He lived at the family home at 100 Harbor Road. He has written 13 books, many on the seacoast area, and owns a successful Portsmouth publishing house. In both these cap in capacities, he has been a godsend to all of those wishing to see regional history and photography preserved and nourished. He helped to found the Portsmouth Marine Society, publisher of this volume. Rosemary Clary has often talked with third generation local artist Deirdre O'Leary of Genesis Beach, named, nicknamed Dee Dee. She was a crew member of the first Atlanta Queen many years ago and still often goes boating out of Rye Harbor. Novelist John Irving was born in Exeter, New Hampshire in 1942 and attended Phillips Exeter Academy where his stepfather taught history. Irving's novel, Cider House Rules, later made into a highly popular movie, was based largely on his work as a youth at the Applecrest Farms in nearby Hampton Falls. The novel, A Prayer for Owen Meany, makes frequent mention of Rye Harbor. In August 2004, a motion picture titled Simon Birch, roughly based on A Prayer for Owen Meany, was released. In one section of the novel, Irving writes, or we would write, or we would drive to a popular daytime beach, Little Boar's Head, which was beautifully empty at night. We would sit on the seawall and feel the cool air off the ocean and watch the phosphorescence sparkle on the surf. Kind of like last night with the full moon, oh my gosh. The breakwater itself had been built with the slag, the broken slabs, from the Meany granite quarry. Therefore, I have a right to sit here, Owen, Owen, Owen always said. No one, of course, ever challenged our being there. Valentine Books, page 286. Irving then discusses a naturalist who wrote a book about starfish called The Life of the Tide Pool. He spent two years scrutinizing the tide pool in Rye Harbor. Valentine Books, page 312. Later, Irving writes, and in the morning... Long before the child stirs, I hear the gulls, and I think about the tomato red pickup pickup cruising the coastal road between Hampton Beach and Rye Harbor. Valentine Books, page 424. Further on, Irving writes, It was a warm spring night. I followed the tomato red pickup to the coast. I knew where he was going. I was sure he wanted to sit at the breakwater in Rye Harbor. The breakwater was made of the slag, the broken slabs, from the meany granite quarry. Owen always felt he had a right to sit there. From the breakwater, you get a pretty view of the tiny harbor in the spring. Not that many boats were in the water, yet it didn't feel quite like summer, which was the time of year when we usually sat there. Valentine Books, page 477. Later in the book, Irving says that he drove to the Rye Harbor breakwater at midnight. The boats slapping on their moorings and the surf striking the breakwater outside the harbor had conditioned the gulls there to remain undisturbed to any noise of water. Then I climbed out along the breakwater. The tide was high and going out. I waded into the harbor channel off the tip of the breakwater. I was quickly submerged up to my chest and I had to retreat to the last slab of granite on the breakwater. He then adds, I saw the sun come up like a bright marble on the granite gray surface of the Atlantic. Valentine Books, page 555 and 556. Irving's last reference to our book subject says something that undoubtedly sums up his root feelings and those of others for this magical spot. I knew I was going to miss the view of the Atlantic Ocean from the breakwater at Rye Harbor. Valentine Books, page 570. In 1973, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Bruce L. Valley published a short book titled Rye Harbor and Other Poems of the Seacoast. He grew up in Rye and told author Rosemary Clary he recalls 20 of his closest friends moving through the salt marsh in the 1950s across from Rye Harbor in search of the Indian burial ground and treasure from the Spanish ship. He also recalls swimming at 55 degree water with Betty of the Red Cross. 
The Halley graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy in 1962, after which he accepted an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. While there, he wrote short stories and poetry, wrote and directed a musical, and arranged, musical, and arranged music for the Academy Orchestra, Drum and Bugle Corps, and Rock Band. Upon graduating from the Naval Academy in 1966, he entered flight training and became a pilot. After a year in the Mediterranean, engaged in anti-submarine warfare, he volunteered to serve in Vietnam and spent two years as commander of Big Mother, a combat rescue helicopter operation along the coast of North Vietnam. Wrights Valley, most of the poems in his 1973 publication were written during the long hours between missions in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> he finished the poetry volume, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1969, but it was almost completely destroyed in a fire that gutted his home in Japan. Fortunately, New Hampshire publisher Peter Randall had six of the originals. Valley writes, this small volume of poetry is intended to describe the stoic, hearty magnificence of the seacoast of New Hampshire and the experience of growing up in its world of granite stone walls, crashing breakers, and soaring gulls. My boyhood was spent in Rye, a quaint seaside town whose singular beauty I feel lies in the primitive warmth of small town friendship and the sharp contrasts of, of crag, craggy shoreline, rustling marsh grass, and soft woodland. Harris's poem, Rye Harbor. We wonder which Vietnam battle he worried over while writing these words. Rye Harbor, the quaintest port on the eastern shore lies quietly on the stumpy coast of a minor state of granite fame. It's small, that's sure, but sound and calm and holds the lobster boat array. I used to stand on bent salt grass and share with gulls the stormy day. They'd fly or glide across against the sky and scream to me, it's going to rain. Oh, can one go close by the mouth? Beyond the cross-topped cross sailor's den, which lives in open gray shingled defiance. There the jetties stand apart, yet reach together across the gap. Like hands that are about to shake, then move apart as if to allow a homebound lobster boat to pass. I love this place. It represents the essence of the words New England. It stands both enemy and friend. To wind waves the wearing of time. Another poem in this volume is titled The Old Lobsterman. It is fitting that we end our book with this simple look out toward the ocean from Rye Harbor. And I'll show you a picture of the harbor before I read that. There's the harbor. <clears throat> the Old Lobsterman by Bruce Valley. At five each morn, a boat casts off and passes out to sea. It leaves the rocks to windward, then changes course to lee. It's a lobster boat, the Jesse Ann, quite aged, but somehow proud. A wrinkled oldster mans the helm, his gnarled hands line the shroud. It's old McCann, I hear one say, been lobstering 40 years. He sells them down at Saunders at the Harbor Master's Piers. I watched a week he'd leave at dawn, be the weather clear or stern. The western setting of the sun was a mark for his return. But then one day he came not home from a dark and storm-tossed sea. The others thought him drowned and lost, but not one moment me. For I had seen his salty eye and the vigor in his hand. I knew that far beyond the shoals was home for that lobster man. It's beautiful. And that, my friends, concludes 
The book beautifully written about just Rye Harbor by Thomas and Rosemary Clary, edited by Peter E. Randall. So thank you for joining us at the Rye Historical Society. While we have read through the pandemic, various historical um, books that we have on Rye, and we look forward to seeing you in the future at the museum. Uh, we are open by appointment and sometime in the future, we will be open on Saturdays again. We haven't quite determined that, but tune in, catch us on our Facebook, call us, email us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Again, Deb Tui saying, stay well, stay healthy, get vaccinated. We're almost through this. So hang in there, everybody. Thanks. Good night.